Hey everyone, welcome back to Gray Area's Artist Spotlight Series. My name is Austin Miller, and today it is my pleasure to introduce one of the most in-demand artists in all of dance music today, Grammy Award winner Carlos Sid, known to listeners around the globe as Sid. Carlos, dude, thanks for cutting some time out of your day for us, man. I Thank know you. you're I know you're Thank kind of you. busy getting ready to kick off this tour that you got going on. Yeah, I'm excited. That was a great intro, by the way. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. Tour starts uh it just started and and you know it's it's awesome to be able to go out there and play all these different cities and bringing out some guests i've dylan nathaniel on a bunch of shows nice that's gonna be a solid show yeah and <laughs> kyle walker's playing one and uh truth and lies these other guys from new york that are on the come up are, are, are playing a couple too so i'm super excited nice man now like at- is it kind of do you ever kind of get like a surreal moment where you're kind of looking back where you're you know you're about to kick off this big tour do you ever kind of get this little surreal moment where you're like dang I'm about to tour the country and I'm bringing all of these guys out with me like how did I get to this point here yeah you know it's yeah all the time man I'm just grateful that I can you know I was talking to someone yesterday and I'm just like we get to just make music and DJ you know it's so you always have to just take a second and realize, you know, that we're able to do this for, for a living. And, you know, when I started, I was DJing weddings and, you yeah. know, <laughs> having parties. So for me, it's like crazy. You know, every once in a while, I get someone who like hit me up and be like, hey, can you DJ? Like you DJ my, you know, wedding like, <laughs> a long time ago. I was like, ah, I don't do those anymore. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, man, it's 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 awesome. I'm, to be able to do this for sure that's amazing man now you've checked a lot of boxes in your career so far like globally touring dj grammy award-winning producer label boss like how do you balance all those plates how does your head not just constantly spin off your body <laughs> it spins off my body yeah <laughs> um i i mean i i love every you know just being able to do all facets of it you know i guess the label side is is really fulfilling because it's like um i'm able to kind of just be you know listen to all this music and be like i think this kid is has something special and 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 want to kind of pioneer the same way that steve angelo helped me years ago with size and tiesto with musical freedom and um and obviously cascade doing i did a track on arcade it's like i want to there's so many new talented producers out there that i just want to be able to help them so that you know that's like motivation on that side and then the other one you know DJing and producing is just they go hand in hand you know so it's it's just always exciting and I'm just excited to 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 do everything even though some days I don't sleep much but yeah yeah. (laughs) but it's worth it in the end man you go to bed with a smile on your face I bet that's amazing man so you know before there was there were like the Tomorrowland headlines and night service only you know there was Carlos Sid, a, a New York kid with an ear for a groove. You know, could you kind of tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how music even first made its way into your life? Like, what are some of your earliest memories with music to begin with? Um, I think the earliest. So I, my family's from Spain. Um, and I, for some reason, I must have been four, three or four years old or five, maybe. Um, and I was obsessed with the song La Bamba. Okay. And they were performing it on like late. It was past my bedtime or something. Yeah. I just remember this. And my parents were like, you could stay up and watch this because you're like, <laughs> I love this song so much. So that was probably my earliest memory. And also, you know, no one in my family was, you know, pursued music, but my my grandfather was you know, very musical. And then my mom was very musical. She had played piano. So from an early age, just like sitting down on the piano with her and mm-hmm. uh, just like learning how to play, you know, whatever. Um, probably my earliest memories for sure. That's really cool, man. Now, did was it kind of just, you know, plinking around on the piano with her? Did you ever do any like formal lessons or anything or? Just, yeah, just messing around. I never did lessons, but it kind of just sparked that like, wow like I understand notes and stuff and then yeah. from there you know my my grandparents had a piano in their house so on weekends if my mom would be like all right you're gonna go 
hang out with your grandparents. I just sit at the piano and and just try to figure out a song by ear. So I would just mm-hmm. kind of tip around. Um, and that was early on. And my oldest brother's very musical. So he always oh. had, you know, like keyboards in the house and mm-hmm. and drums. So if, again, when he was, he's 10 years older than me. So when he was probably like 16, we had a drum set in my basement. Yeah. And like when he wasn't home, I'd just be like down there, you know, <laughs> teaching myself how to play the drum, just banging away. But yeah, it was always just like out of like curiosity, I guess, yeah. that I picked up music. Yeah, that's awesome. That kind of organic curiosity that makes it like the things that you do learn, the things that you do kind of discover along the way, just planking around, just tapping around. It makes it stick really well. Yeah, for that sure. stuff stick. I'm not, I was never good at school. Mm-hmm. Um, learning in like the sense of like, you need to memorize this. And yeah. so I think I probably would have been discouraged if I pursued music as opposed to like, I'm my brain the way of even with production, it's always like, how do I figure this out? You know, like, yeah. I hear this melody and like, let me like figure it out on a piano as opposed to like, what are those notes? And yeah. what are they called? And that, that was the early, you know, I had no idea what notes I was playing, but I kind of figured out yeah, how to play it. That, yeah. That's just how my brain works. But. Yeah. Well, and I bet that makes it so much easier than like having to, uh, than like having to go in and like, whether, I don't know if you use Logic or if you use Ableton or, but like having to go in and like basically draw out the melodies, like mm. clicking it one at a time, dude, that is, that can be such yeah. a painstaking process. It is so much easier if you can actually just like play it out and then yeah. go in the back end and like finagle where, finagle where you need to. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I do both ways, you know, but to generally it's, I feel creative, like playing in a melody and even mm-hmm. if it's like okay there's stuff i want to change then yeah. i go in and like you know edit the notes in the midi but yeah for sure man that's so what like what kind of music like when you were when you were growing up in a relatively musical household what kind of music were you into before you came across dance music so my brothers are one's 10 the oldest is 10 years older and the next one's eight i'm the youngest so mm-hmm. i was always exposed to like different music from an early age um and we like on weekends my mom I was probably super young but we would go to like Tower Records or whatever it was or The Wiz or one of these places um and so my brothers always had like just albums full of CDs um and I was just across the board exposed because of that like even within my brothers they were just uh, into such different music like my mm-hmm. older brother loved like classic rock and um uh, and stuff like that and then my middle brother loved like r&b and hip-hop yeah um and you know in the 90s when there was a uh, kind of like a mini like dance explosion mm-hmm. with you know then i was exposed to like you know robin s show me love and and like that like era of of like what worked in dance music in the yeah. u.s yeah yeah, yeah. And so it was just super eclectic. And then, you know, as a, from my Spanish background, I was always exposed to from, you know, summers in Spain. I'd be like, oh, like, I guess this is the song of the summer here. Or yeah. like, um, so it was just very, like you said, very eclectic. Yeah. You know, uh, variety of music that I kind of grew up listening to. Um, yeah, man. And like now, do you kind of see, uh, I, I imagine you probably do, that your, like, your early kind of taste your early exposures whether it's from your like eldest brother your middle brother or your Spanish background it seems that all of those things at some point or another through your library kind of make their way into your music like dude your track uh Duro I have been rinsing that thing since you put it out last year I just love like the like the kind of spiciness that it has to it it just has such this this really pleasant little groove but uh do you ever find that those early kind of fascinations in music bleed into your music nowadays yeah definitely i i mean look, i think one of my definitely one of my first cds was uh was that tlc album um that had no scrubs on it mm-hmm. uh and I, I did that sample like you know f- five six years ago and it was just like with a lot of the times for these samples it's not like oh let me use this sample it's like i'll start a groove and in my for some reason i'll get like I'll just start singing that song. So that's how like that came about. And it's like, yeah, because I was exposed to it at an early age and and just 
I don't know. It's just like things just in there. And I'm like, oh, this would be cool, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I don't know. It's just, again, like just having a. I think the best producers and and DJs are the ones that have just a very broad, you know, library tucked in their head of music and yeah. and, friends and then and be like, oh, this came from this and, you know, or this, you know, melody is a reference to this old song and yeah like yeah man that's what especially with nowadays with like how much like how much music is coming out and how accessible um like production softwares and stuff like that with like sample packages and things like splice and all that um with how um accessible all that is there's so much music coming out from so many different people even if it's just like one or two little tracks that someone just made in their free time and especially with like TikTok and stuff like that now dude yeah. the it is like this the wild west once again kind of just with these really quick little like 15 second like hooks now granted mm. from a from a like fully artistic standpoint it maybe doesn't quite have the same like body it doesn't have the same like substance yeah. but it's amazing to see just the sheer volume of new material that is coming out across the board in so many different genres. And it's cool to see how they're all occasionally kind of starting to like bleed together a little bit, you know, dance music is making its way into, or it's having an influence in a lot of different, a lot of different uh, genres right now. It's very interesting yeah. to see. Yeah. hundred percent. I think kind of touching on what you're saying, it's like the level of the bar of entry is very low you know meaning you can get ableton you can go on youtube and um and learn how to produce mm -hmm. so that side of it is is become so accessible it's it's more about the creative idea so people are able to learn faster mm -hmm. and then focus on the excitement of being creative which yeah. you know, i maybe when i started there wasn't there wasn't a lot of youtube videos you know i would yeah. go to I would go to Barnes and Noble yeah. and with like whatever computer music and, yeah. and like be like, oh, that's how you do that. You know, yeah. not like now, even I, I still do it. I'm, I'm, you know, learn every day, but it's like you can go to Google and or YouTube and and just figure out how to do something on the technical side. But mm -hmm. you can't on the creative side. That's where I think like people are able to just be more creative and mm -hmm. because they don't have to worry about like, Oh, how do I do this? It's just, yeah. that part can be instant, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's quite interesting, man. It's, a, it's certainly a, especially just as a music fan, it's a really cool time for music discovery, but mm -hmm. I, and I bet, especially as someone now who's like a label boss, I bet that your inbox is just flooded with all sorts of like new sounds and stuff. And, but maybe the flip side also, maybe you're getting a lot of stuff that probably sounds the same too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a catch 22, you know, I, I, and again, it's, it's, it's new when you're learning, it's, you're always going to be in, more inspired by something else, you know, and that's the best way to learn. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have a favorite artist or a favorite track at the moment. You're like, I want to make something like that. And, and you end up copying it. And yeah, I mean, I think the big example was Chris Lake, you know, over mm -hmm. the pandemic, he was doing these like demo listening and like, yeah, every record sounded like one of <laughs> like he made it, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. but it's, it's just a way of entry. And I think for new artists, it's about doing that, you know, and figuring out how they did this. But mm -hmm. once you unlock it's second nature, like, Oh, this, I can do this like this instantly. Then it's more about, how do I make this my own, you know, yeah. and it's not, there's a, it's a double-sided edge because you don't want to be too different where mm -hmm. nobody can fit your music in their set, yeah. but you want to be the record that fits in, you know, whoever's set, but stands out. So there's yeah. always that like thin line that you're like walking on. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now kind of going back to, you know, talking about new, new producers, new artists, do you recall your first exposure to electronic music? Like, was there, can you think, dig up a memory where you were just like, this is electronic music? What is this? Um, yeah. So again, I was very young, but there yeah. was this like era of like, I want to call it like, uh, who are the artists? Uh, my mind is drawing a blank right now but not like Ace of Base. There was another, there was an, 
another artist, but it was like around the time of like, um, there were these like really like Euro dance hits in the US. Okay. okay. I was just, you know, whenever we had family parties or whatever, those are the songs that I would just like start dancing to. And like, mm-hmm. for some reason, I'm a terrible freaking dancer now, but I was just <laughs> the most confident little kid. And I was like, I'm an awesome dancer. Uh, so that's probably the earliest. Um, and then I can not why am I blanking on the artist? doesn't matter. Um, but obviously I think then Daft Punk, when one more time just like exploded, I was like, yeah. what is this? This is awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and then there was a point in like seventh grade that I just was like, I want to be a DJ, you know, and New York was not very, um, like dance music driven like everyone was listening to hip-hop and stuff yeah. but i was okay for some reason this is just how i was i gravitated to anything electronic so at first yeah. it was like trance and and um at the time in new york it was like a, a kind of like a hard house like sound i guess um, okay and that was the beginning for me you know and f- yeah. from there just like i didn't know i didn't have taste and like i didn't know what was out there yeah. It was just like I was being fed what what was like popular and yeah. then yeah. there I developed I developed my taste, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Now so with the so those kind of hard house sounds a little bit, like was that kind of was that pull the what pulled you into kind of like the like mixing side of things too? Like wh- how did you when did wh- sorry, where did your narrative kind of switch from fan to contributor? When did you first kind of start putting one, the one and the two deck behind each other so seventh grade my best friend um i told him because he was another kid who was like the same as me and just always very into music i said let's start dj yeah. um and i bought a used vestax mixer from this record shop the, you know that's how i discovered the record shop yeah. it's like, where can i buy like some used dj equipment huh so i bought this it was like a hundred dollars or hundred fifty dollars, like a yeah. really old shitty, yeah, like Vestax mixer. Yeah. Um, and then, so my dad has a, a restaurant and catering hall. So oh, growing cool. up, even when I was younger, like ten years old, I was the same thing, just fascinated with this guy. And I was like, I want to learn how to do that. And I'd be, you know, obviously my he would do a lot of the parties, so mm-hmm. I would. He knew who I obviously. I'm like, okay, I'm the owner's son. Like I'm, yeah. He was like curious, like I'll, I'll show him, and he ended up lending me uh, like an old Denon like dual CD player that was like old and like crappy. Okay. <laughs> um, and that's how I started, you know, just on CDs, obviously. Um, and it was just me and my friend. We'd have we'd be in my basement, just kind of learning how to DJ. Yeah, that was the start, you know, for me. It was that, and then I, at the time, I want I was like I wanted because again, it was like hard to find dance music on even cds it was mm-hmm. more everything was on records yeah uh, so i was like oh, i wanted I, I was like for christmas i was like i want to get a turntable so that year for christmas i got like a, a new mark belt, like drive. A belt drive yep <laughs> worst one possible but it worked <laughs> and then i started the place that i got the mixer from i was like oh they sell records there yeah. and that's where i would go and every you know you know every couple of weeks um and there was a guy who worked there his name was roger ugly or his name <laughs> was roger ugly I, I connected him with him like 10 years later um yeah. and that would he would just be like oh these are the new records that came in like and like kind of like she teach me like he's like what do you like and he, he play like four i'd be like i have one, i can only buy one but i like this one like i'll take yeah. this one today or whatever um and that's just how developed you know and it Mm -hmm. from there just yeah you know just uh figuring out what what i liked i guess yeah what and what got me excited to actually like practice djing and stuff yeah well i was about to say that was was something i was going to ask is you know once you got those new marks like was it something where you were on the decks just like all the time like kid in the candy store just making whatever records you could spin together or was it kind of like an ebb and flow thing like you went on it and then it kind of fell off and went on it kind of fell on even this i was always on it dude i mean even i remember 
well, in eighth grade we had like a graduation like paperback yearbook uh-huh it literally it was like what do you want to be when you grow up and i said i I put down, I said, I want to be a DJ. Like that was my career answer. Everyone was like, I want to be a doctor. Yeah. I want to be this. I was like, I want to be a DJ. So it, it was never an off switch. Like, um, I was just loved it. And any chance I could, could, I was just focused on that. And then, you know, I was lucky enough where I, my dad started recommending me like secretly, like, Oh, I have a DJ. And at this point I had yes, like a dad. basic setup. So he would, he would recommend me to, for these private, you know they were small that he would give me like oh somebody's throwing a party for like 50 people and they're like do you want a good dj for cheap like yeah um so i started djing these parties so now it's like it's my hobby but i was able to kind of start making a little money and okay and every like you know once a whatever it was every weekend or every other weekend that i'd be djing these parties and then i just reinvested that money and in, in more equipment and uh and stuff like that so it was always you know from the i was hooked for mm -hmm. from the beginning yeah and it was never something that i was i like said ah, i'm not gonna do this now you know? yeah yeah now were, were you kind of doing those parts starting to do those little parties with with the recommendation there was that kind of like through high school at that point yeah probably the first one i did was yeah maybe like sophomore junior year of high school no maybe before yeah my either my freshman or sophomore year of high school I was just mm -hmm. already able to start doing doing those I did them all through high school and then into college um yeah nice man now like did you at what point did you switch up from those new marks to a to a better model there was there well, a point got, where you're like okay I need to I need to upgrade a little bit here <laughs> I got techniques oh man I can't remember when uh yeah, so at some point in high school, I got techniques. Nice. And then I got a better, like for the mobile party, it was all like I'd burn CDs and, you know, it was the type, it was a lot of Latin parties. So I would be yeah. DJing like merengue, cumbia, salsa. Nice. At the, and, and then like, I'd squeeze in like a couple dance tracks too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was probably in high school. I was just, if I made like a hundred bucks, I'd save it, make another, you know, whatever it was. And then end up upgrading everything and nice and, uh, yeah cool man now so when you first kind of started mixing when you first started putting one record another record together to make new record was do you remember like that that first feeling that you had like when you first got you know the the beat to sync up and the rhythms to line up and the melodies to line up to create kind of like that magical third track that you might never hear again they, I did. It's, you're probably the first person to ever asked me that question. But yeah, yeah, yeah it was weirdly there was one moment where I had uh, I can't remember the, what tracks they were, obviously, but there was there was two vocal phrases in them. And yeah, it was just that moment where I was like, whoa, this is so weird. Like this vocal starts at the beginning of the bar. This one starts at the end. And when I play them together they just sound like one like they're talking to each other and it's one record yeah and I, I remember that just like redoing that mix for like what what a week or whatever yeah. being so excited. <laughs> yes i do have that moment like yeah oh man let's go back i was just a race i just start over and the, you know the excitement of yeah like, that yeah. that like that kind of blissful like innocence a little bit that like first time excitement well and it's funny you bring that up because i was about to i was just about to ask you know how does that kind of compare to you know the feelings that you get now doing headline sets for the biggest festivals in the world like edc and tomorrowland and bonnaroo and all that you know someone asked me the other day it's like a up-and-coming artist and they they played a big show and they were like you know my my music just was getting these crazy reactions and like the feeling of that is was so crazy he's like does that ever go away i'm like no like you know there's no better feeling than knowing you you know made a track and you know i, I would tend to work alone so it's like you don't know what people's reactions going to be and and just like that's the most exciting thing for me it's like when you play something you know you you made and like the like that like adrenaline you get from playing it out and seeing people react to it is just 
never goes away. You yeah. Know? Um, Dude, that you, was, you, yeah. That, that's amazing. And well, and even, uh, you know, j- you hit the nail on the head, like even just showing someone shoot, even driving in the car and you like have someone in the car and you're like, yo, listen to this song really quick. And even just getting a reaction from someone be like, yo, this is great. What is this? That alone is one of the highest compliments, even like to me, like whether giving or receiving, just saying like, yo, I like this song. What is this? So I can't even imagine like the extra level that it takes when you're the one that's created that song and then taking it a step further, not just showing it to your homie in the car, but a whole ass crowd of people going nuts for like a track that you haven't even released yet. Like an ID that you have sitting on the back burner, dude, I bet that is amazing. (laughs) Yeah, the homie reaction though is up there, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, you always, everyone has to have like a, a four or five that you're like, Hey, what do you think of this? And if, and like, you really value their, their opinion highly. So that's like super high up there too. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just great to, or it sometimes it goes the other way, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah it's a great feeling for sure. Nice, man. So like kind of what point did you start to, did it start to evolve from, fun hobby that I'm making a few bucks here or there for to, okay, this, this might have some potential to like be my career. Like this, this manifesting I did in the back of my eighth grade yearbook yeah. might have an opportunity to really be a thing. Um, I think it was when my oldest, my, when my brothers was in college, he came home one year with a bunch of like with his PC with a bunch of crack software on it. One of them was, <laughs> I think it was Reason or something. Um, and around the same time, it's like, I was, my mind was like paying attention to who are these people making this music, mm-hmm. you know? Especially on like the clubbier side. And I'm like, why are they all DJs? And I was like, wait, you know, the ones that are coming to the US, cause a lot of them were European, like mm-hmm. they're, f- great DJs but they're known because of their music you Mm -hmm. know so that's what sparked the transition to producing it's like hmm like that makes sense you know how do you stand out as a Mm -hmm. as a DJ um so I just added again just curiosity led me to producing um while I was in high school I guess it was closer to the, the end of high school um and then I went to college for accounting. Okay. And <laughs> that, that is the complete opposite end of the spectrum of music making. <laughs> Which is funny because my oldest brother, who is the most musical, he's, yeah. in, he's in accounting. Uh, he does like private, like fund accounting stuff. Interesting. Um, but when I started college, I was like, I asked him, I was like, what should I, like, what can I do that I'll get a job? And he's like, do accounting. And I was like, all right. I was always good at numbers, you know, okay. that, that was, but, you know, so he yeah. probably saw that. Um, anyway, so I was in school for accounting and I, you know, I had uh, to take extra courses for in whatever I wanted. And mm-hmm. I took a music course and it was in like garage band. Um, okay. And I'd already kind of dabbled in production. And I was just, again, the, from that just kind of the professor was a really, really really awesome uh teacher and um i learned a lot in that class and then it was just like man this is actually what i really want to do yeah Um, and around the same time i finished uh you know i done a million ideas whatever and it was there was one track that i did that it was probably like the first thing that i fully finished Mm -hmm. um and i i played it for a bunch of friends like this is really good i'm like at the time, not to sound like arrogant, but it was Dude, toot your really horn, bad. man. Toot your horn. No, it, was, it was like it was pretty bad looking back, but it was, you know, <laughs> I had never finished a song. I was like, this is kind of cool. And at, at yeah. the time, I was listening to a lot of uh, like uh, State of Trance, and and mm-hmm. but I gravitated more to Marcus Schultz Global DJ Broadcast because okay. it was still these like melodic things, but it was like more it had more groove instead of like yeah. full trance. Yeah. So I was like, let me just email this to, to Mark. Like I found a like info at global DJ broadcast uh-huh. and um, I just emailed it and didn't hear back. 
and four weeks later i get an email and it's like like holy shit like i love this like is it still available can i sign it and i'm just like what this is not real. like this is a joke or one of my friends is playing a joke on me yeah i told him i said okay like if you really want like give me a call and obviously i was living at home with my parents at the time mm -hmm. and marcus schultz called my house line at like midnight or something and dude <laughs> yeah, man, like I, I really like the song i was like okay sure and i had no idea like i didn't know what mixing was mastering uh -huh. I, like i didn't know any of this stuff i was like well, okay like do i need to change anything he's like no it's great as it is just you know i'll connect you with uh with the label and we'll just send you paperwork and sign it i was like all right and like a year later it came out and he played in new york um i forget what club it was but i remember being in the club and uh -huh. him playing it and i was that was the moment i was like this is what i like i already knew it's what i wanted to do but I was yeah. like, this is what i want to do for the rest of my life like yeah um and it just grew from there you know and that was that was i was still in college i finished accounting mm -hmm. um it's kind of dr dragging out a little bit but yeah yeah i think that that was that combination of of uh, events kind of led me to being like okay after i graduate i'm not gonna work in accounting or try to get a job i'm gonna try to focus on music and i was yeah. djing now at this point like you know small lounges in the city mm -hmm. like kind of making a little bit of money but still wanting to focus on on production yeah. um and yeah that's i guess that's that was the beginning i think as the as a career that's awesome man that's that's a really cool story I, like now there was that kind of launching point was that connection with marcus schultz was that kind of like where the networking or where your network started as an artist surprisingly no he was always open but it was again it was kind of like a bit of a fluke okay looking back a fluke record right i did it in uh -huh. reason uh -huh. I, like didn't really know what i was doing i yeah. knew enough to, like have an idea play you know chords and you know make up chords whatever and melodies and, and mm -hmm. stuff but um i bought right after that i was like i saw um Gabriel and Dresden, and they were like, mm -hmm. they did some article or, or something. And I saw that they were using logic. I was like, I need to use logic. Yeah. And then when I got logic, I was like, what the, how, like, I remember going to guitar center and like, they had a computer set up with it. Yeah. And for like, I'm just sitting there. I was like, how do I get it to make sound? Yeah. Like, so long story short, um, it was like a missed opportunity, you know, and that's okay. in a way because I wasn't ready you know mm -hmm. he was ready to hear new music but i maybe sent him a couple of things and it just like it fizzled and yeah uh, so after i graduated the main i'd say the the main connection that happened for me that started growing my network was a friend from high school his dad um is uh, richie canada who was the original sax player for billy joel no way yeah and i knew like we were friends sick. <laughs> yeah like we were friends in high school like go to he'd have like you know weekend parties at his house or whatever yeah, yeah. you know we would hang out but i knew his dad i knew who his dad was whatever but i never like thought about it and i was djing in the city at some random lounge mm -hmm. um and i finished djing one day and i'm i'm out in the club and this, he's like did you go to this high school i was like yeah he's like wait and we had that moment because we hadn't seen each other like yeah. this is college we hadn't seen each other in like at this point probably five years he's like what yeah. are you doing i was like djing like you know trying to produce and he said well why don't you come out of the studio and i was like okay so i went i met his dad and his dad's like i'll give you an internship sure and that's so that was now i had access to like um learn from engineers who like yeah. knew what we're really doing and and stuff and he you know he gave me after a couple months he trusted me and he gave me a set of keys he's like whenever like nobody's using nice. the studio you can use the studio and yeah. that type of thing. um and that was where it kind of started growing for me you know you know i owe a lot to obviously aaron canada who's that's the son he's mm -hmm. killing it i mean he's he's in la now and he's producing stuff for like demi lovato and like nice 
Nice. And I owe a lot to his dad. You know, his dad gave me an opportunity there. Um, and from there, I got connected to this guy. I wanted to be an engineer. I was like, ah, like I love dance music, but I want to focus on like mixing records. Like mm -hmm. I want to be like the biggest mix engineer, like mixing mm -hmm. all the pop songs. Like I, it was fascinating. Like I had access yeah. to the studio that was all like, you know, SSL board and like giant racks of like compressors and stuff. Yeah. And Richie was like, but you're really good at this house thing. And I was like, yeah, but I want to do this. He's like, but like, you know how to produce. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. He's like, well, you should focus on that too. And I was like, I know, but I, I like want to do this right now. Um, and he encouraged me to, to kind of make sure I stayed focused on, on production, especially dance music, because he mm. saw that I had a knack for it. Uh, one of the people he connected me with was this guy, Greg Bahari, who's like a old, the older um, DJ producer. And he was based in Jersey and he was self-made. You know, this guy had his own label, was in a DJ duo with uh, this guy, Chris Malinchak. Okay. Um, Chris Malinchak had, he did a song after they had split, which mm -hmm. was so good to me that, I don't know if you feel so good to me. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm with you. Um, but, you know, I started working with Greg and he, he was the one who really mentored me on house music and like okay. taught me about sampling and, yeah. and stuff. And, and that's, I'd say that was the original person that I think had, because he was in dance, like had understood the business. And I, yeah. I still talk to this guy almost every, every day, if not once a week, like yeah. or, or twice a week, but he was there from the beginning to not only kind of, you know, we did music together um, because he, he had a great ear and mm -hmm. I would be like, you know, uh, whatever. He would have an idea or be like, oh, like I kind of know how to use everything, but he still had the ear be like, oh, like boost this EQ here. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of, again, like refined yeah. as, as like a, as like a house producer. Um, so I would say that like, time of between the studio meeting greg that was like the jump start of like where my network started to grow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a little bit long-winded yeah no you're all good <laughs> yeah yeah i know it but do you, well and the thing is like making those connections making that network it's it's not like it's not just a simple process it's not like this direct route there's no direct story for it you know it's it's a very circuitous thing and about like this person and then this person, then that line and that line and that yeah. line, they all just connect to make this one opportunity that then kind of grows into something else. Yeah. And, and on the other, the same side of that is I was very fortunate where, you know, I got lucky, you know, mm -hmm. I, I met someone like Greg, who's a good person who, you know, was wanted to help make me a better producer and help encourage me to, to, to have all these different opportunities you know as opposed to you know you're a young artist there's definitely some people who will take advantage of you and mm -hmm. and on the flip side it's like you have this one opportunity with this person that person knows that yeah so they're going to use it to their advantage you know the music industry is a very can be you know you have to be very careful as as mm -hmm. far as you know who you trust and I, I was lucky that this that you know someone like that was there to mentor me early on for sure Awesome, man. Well, shout out, Greg. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, dude, as much notoriety as you've gotten in your headline sets and all that, you get it. We've kind of already touched on it, but you get even almost even more for your capabilities as a producer. You know, even winning a Grammy for that legendary remix of Summertime Sadness and then picking up a nomination for that remix of LSD's audio. Now, uh, can you kind of walk us through that? First of all, can you walk us through that experience or the feelings that you experienced? when you won like music's highest award or one of music's highest awards? Yeah. So, um, quickly, I guess through Greg, he linked, we got in the studio with someone who was from Miami who, uh, we worked with for a week. That guy went back to Miami and was, he's like, I just met this kid, Carlos, who's like, mm. whatever was bigging me up to all these people. And one of them was Cedric. Okay. Uh, so, uh Cedric Gervais who yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, did the remix with and Cedric I guess was like oh I want to meet this kid like you know have these records blah blah um so I started working with Cedric 
um, at first it was, he had a bunch of music and it was um, kind of mixing and, and stuff. And then it, he saw that I was talented on the production side. Mm -hmm. So I started working with him on, on everything from start to finish from there on out. And yeah, I mean, we did that remix and we were, you know, it was, it came together in a day or something and you don't really think about it. You know, you make something, you're like, this is cool, mm -hmm. but you don't, you don't fathom like that, you know, so many things have to line up yeah. in music, you know, you can. Yeah. And I think I was just so kind of like young and not like a little bit naive to it. I was just like, yeah, it's a cool remix. And then it just kept growing. And I was yeah. just like, holy shit, like this is, this is crazy. So yeah, for me, it was, it was an interesting one. Obviously I, you know, co-produced the remix. Mm -hmm um but winning winning that for me was just like uh, uh was it like uh, giving validity is that mm -hmm. what yeah, yeah 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 like myself kind of like affirming what you've been yeah doing. affirming my abilities as a producer so yeah uh you know and my family was you know had especially uh, I was still living at home you know my mm -hmm. parents and my family was, was so proud of of you know, it, for me, it was more that it's, it was like them get, you know, being able to have something now, like he's been yeah. doing the music thing and, and, you know, this, you know, I won a Grammy and, and yeah. that was important to them. Uh, for me, it was more like, I can do this for myself, you know? And that was, that was the moment where I was just like, I want to just focus on my, on my own career. Um, yeah. And that really gave me the confidence to do it. It's like, nice. I got here, like, I want to come back here and it'd be my name, you know, yeah. up there. Yeah. And, and from that point on, it was, you know, it was really like putting myself first as far as, uh, as a producer and as an artist. Yeah. Um, and yeah, for me, the going back for obviously remixing the audio LSD yeah. uh, record, it was just like, that was just such an incredible experience to be able to go back and be like, I made it back, you know, yeah. not many people can, can get one nomination, you know, and, and that for me, was just like such like a special moment to like be there again. Um, oh, that's yeah. a beautiful thing, man. That's a beautiful thing. Shoot. And now, and even with that notoriety, like you certainly have not just catered to one sound though. Like your, your library is such a wide array of sounds and themes, like over the years, you know, you've put out like big room bangers. You put out like how or tech house and bass house, like mm. late night deep house, electro pop, like and everything in between. And you always like to keep, you know, it always seems you're keeping listeners on their toes and you've really kind of kept your sound quite diverse. So I'm kind of wondering like what even inspires you or, or guides you when you're making music? Like what makes you go, this is what this next track is going to be. Does it even start as I'm making a XYZ track or do you get a melody out and you're like, this is kind of the direction it's involving or evolving to on its own. Yeah. You know, obviously I'm as a producer, like I'm, I can make anything, mm -hmm. you know, and not to be arrogant about it, but like you can make, I can figure out how to yeah. make whatever. And I think that's a gift and a curse. Right. So yeah. the best artists are the ones that have, a very distinct sound mm -hmm. um and again it's like when i talked to if looking back there was a moment where um you know i did a track with don diablo called got me thinking mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of housey like leftish or like, like a little left um and then you know after the success of all the cedric stuff i was like well i'm really good at this like i should just do that but but that was already kind of done, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, you know, my biggest piece of advice for new artists is don't rush into, into it. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think, yes, I was able to kind of pivot a, a few times, but um, find your lane and really focus on that. And, you know, Don Diablo was just someone who really helped me um, kind of get on my own two feet. And then obviously, mm -hmm off of that record got me thinking that we did together then cascade took me under his wing and 
and I was able opened up to to all of you know his fan base and, and mm-hmm. stuff. So, um, yeah, you know, it's just like I kind of as I was starting out the first few years of my artist project, kind of figuring out what I really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think even you know when I was on tour with Cascade, it's like a lot of my sets were more techie and housey because I'm opening for him, you mm-hmm. know. So. Um, and I just enjoyed making that more. So I, I think for me, it was, it was, it's great to, to kind of be able to pivot. But, um, I think about pre pandemic, uh, to like a year or so before it was like, I made a conscious effort and of being like having more tunnel vision of like, this is what I want to do. Like, yeah. this is what I enjoy making in the studio and, and staying focused on like, trying to have a more consistent sound it gets just could still be something that's you know a little like as long as it fits in a set yeah that i play you know that was yeah. something that was, um that we were i was really conscious about and like you know there was opportunities to be like oh we can do this song with this massive artist as a collab and i'm, I'm but being like tunnel vision like you know people want to know like you said it's unexpected is great yeah. But at the same time, people want to know what they're what they're uh, going to get, you know, yeah. so, um, everything I did, I think, kind of opened up different doors, you know, like the big room. I did a I had done a record on size called Ill Behavior mm-hmm. that Angelo like rinsed for, yeah. for a while. Um, and then I did another one that was more techie uh, called She Wants the D, which is, I know, horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Had nothing it was just that my friend was like it sounds it was like a vocal chop yeah i regret the naming of that song <laughs> um but uh um you know it was just like every piece kind of led me to the same way it was with networking it was like you know, yeah. and tiesto started following me and then i sent him no and and you know it was just it's a, like you said it's you know career in music is you have to be able to pivot in in certain directions, but you never want to be the last one or mm-hmm. late to the party because then it, it, that's never going to work. So, yeah. But, you know, I just think longevity, it's, I just, there's not as much pressure. Like, you know, I could be more creative and like make cool stuff. That's mm-hmm. all I want to do is like, I just want to sit here and make something cool that I could play and hopefully people like it. Not yeah. like, to make a hit song yeah and yeah. like you know which is so unrealistic and like can really like mentally like af- you know uh affect you as an artist where mm-hmm. this you put all this extra pressure on, on yourself it's just about having fun like that's yeah. it at the end that, of the day yeah and at the end of the day, that's why you got into it you know because it was something that was fun and yeah. i think and that's something that like i i hear from a fair number of artists is like they're you know the things that they really enjoy, the the records that they most enjoy putting out and releasing are the ones that they're like, this isn't shooting to be a hit. This isn't shooting to like pander to this audience or anything. This is just something that is, this is just an authentic expression of my creativity at this moment in time. Yeah. And whether that takes this sound or this sound or this shape, that's what it takes. But Re, but regardless of the shape or the sound that it takes, it is coming straight from my creative juices. It is not trying to do anything or become anything that it's not meant to be. Yeah, hundred percent. And like weirdly, those are almost always the songs that people gravitate to. You know, even they may not know this was kind of an exciting moment that you just didn't stress over how the little details and you just put it out and for some reason it even if you don't say it it just comes out in the music and like yeah i've seen that a few times for sure it's like the records that you did in five hours you're like this is cool like i can't change it like it's fine like yeah you know like exactly that like i people gravitate to, towards those yeah dude people people gravitate towards authenticity like in day-to-day life and yep. music uh, and everything that that is something that's so important across the board. And uh, it's cool to see that you like have a sweet understanding of that. I love that. So you one thing. So you've, you mentioned a couple of like 
big, you know, a couple of artists that have like really taken you under their wing over the years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've done heaps of collaborations and uh, like to go along with your solo tracks. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of wondering, like, can you give us some insight into what it's like, like what some insight into the difference between a collaborative effort and a solo effort? Like yeah. for, for as someone who's ha- really had a heavy hand in both. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, as a, you have to be very decisive if you're in the room by yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like you do something, I could write a baseline and be like, it's not good enough. Or like, yeah, like I'm, I could still make it better Mm -hmm. as opposed to like, you're in a room with someone else and you know, you don't have all these things like coming together in your mind to like come up with a baseline. You're just like, that's that's the one that's cool. And I, I really learned that from when I worked with Don Diablo. Mm-hmm. Um, when we, the, one of the first collabs we did was this track got me thinking. Yeah. At the, he, this was the first time we met in person because we had only talked over Skype. Like that's mm-hmm. how we connected. And, and the couple of two or three things that we did, it was like he'd send me a break and he'd be like, do you have like a drop idea for this? I'd be like, yeah. And then like we'd finish stuff that way. But when he came to New York, it just, like that guy's level of thinking was just on another like crazy so we would yeah. be you know he'd be like oh tr- you know try this out i'd get the sound and literally it was like the first thing i played or something mm-hmm. was the bass line and yeah. it was just it was the simplest thing he's like that's it i was yeah. just he's like leave it that's it yeah. don't touch it. and that kind of just made me realize it's like you know, having a collaboration is great because you're bouncing ideas off of each other and, and mm-hmm. being able to like channel each other's taste. Cause at yeah. the end of the day, producing is taste, you know, yeah. like um, if you like something and you think other people are going to like it uh, as opposed. So that's one thing I learned. It's just like being decisive and knowing when it's like the thing mm-hmm. and not being like, not worrying about like, this has to be the greatest baseline yeah. of time yeah it's more like yeah this is the one it's cool let's move on you know yeah. and, and being precious about mm-hmm. about anything because that's when you lose the vibe mm-hmm. about you know in production it's um so yeah i mean that's i think that's the biggest thing i learned from collaborating was you know and it's always great you know i've been kind of collabing with some more up and coming guys more recently and mm-hmm. you seeing how they work is is something that i think like i gave to to bigger producers in the past now it's like oh like you know you know west end is a good example like we worked and when we did uh we did a couple records around jump in and it was it was great to get like a fresh perspective on on how he works and there's stuff i knew that i showed him and there was stuff that he was doing that i was like oh that's pretty cool like i never thought about doing this this way or whatever so you know it's just a learning experience at the end of the day you know working with someone else yeah for sure. And like working with other people, you've also done remixes for like some of music's biggest names, like Halsey and Lizzo and Ellie Goulding and Diplo. And some of those have really popped off like that Lizzo remix. Freaking fire, dude. I know it went viral, but like I and I know you've heard it a million times probably, but I need to say from my own standpoint, freaking bomb. <laughs> um, now, do you like do much engineering work for artists outside of dance music no i mean i've done a few small things here or there you know i did you know during the pandemic i was fortunate where they did this cbs project mm-hmm. which is not necessarily a person but it was you know the president of cbs being like hey do you want to remix the the cbs jingle i was like what <laughs> yeah i was like that sounds cool and it, you know, he wanted stuff that was nothing really related to to dance so yeah it's not my focus i mean Mm -hmm. my focus you know and it's i tell this to other people who who do a lot of outside production work it's like it's very you have you either have to just be like the most focused person ever to be able to do that and then come back and do your artist project so Mm -hmm. for me i made the like the decision i was like i'd rather be you know as i get my artist project going struggling yeah i'll be hungry you know Mm -hmm. to be more successful because you can become more comfortable if you're leaning on on Mm -hmm. that stuff 
not everyone yeah. has that opportunity. You know, I lucked out in a lot of ways where when I made that transition to my artist project, I, um, I signed to big beat, which mm -hmm. kind of gave me a cushion to just focus on myself. But yeah. for guys who were known and people know that they're working on other people's music, uh, you know, in dance or whatever, it's, it's, uh, yeah, finding that balance is really hard. So that's why, like, I don't, I've done sessions. I've, I've worked, you know, I've, there's been opportunities where like I did a down tempo thing that mm -hmm. one major artist was like, it's going to be his single. It's going to be massive. Yeah. It never happens. And you're just like, yeah. why did I waste energy on this? Yeah. Let me focus on my stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I like that. Well, no, because it's especially like, and that's uh, really comes down to like self-awareness, knowing like yourself as an artist, like what you have to give to a project. Like mm -hmm. how much, like what is your working capacity and what is going to be the most successful for you? Because like you were just saying, you know, different, like people diff operate on different levels. You know, some people like they can bounce from one sector to the other and if they can do it, awesome. But if not, mm -hmm. that's cool. But now, so having said that though, like, is there ever part of you, you know, now that like the SID project is like really just doing freaking bananas like is there ever a part of you that has desires to go off and start a different side project that just like has a completely different sound or direction to it there's yeah there's something in the works yeah okay okay i won't pry too much if you're not if you're not trying to give away too much but that's cool yeah, i mean look for for me it was um you know just being again being conscious that like as sid like this is what i the stuff i've been putting out in the last year and a half two years even you know pre-pandemic it's like very much club driven mm -hmm. um, but i still have an itch for for song um so i've been working on something and i'm not gonna hide it but mm -hmm. i'm not gonna necessarily uh promote that i'm doing it with and it's a i'm, I'm working with another producer on that mm -hmm. uh but i'm really excited about the music you know it's nice. it's it's something that I think people who probably really enjoyed some of my more like vocal driven remixes and, mm -hmm. and stuff will, will really be into it. So nice, well, man. Eventually we'll, there'll be more info on that, but yeah. Dude, that's really cool. We'll be looking for that. So now kind of over the years, man, like, so you've been involved with music. You've been involved with DJing and producing for a long time, longer than a lot of, uh, or you started earlier than a lot of other producers and DJs do. Now, in that time, you've obviously grown as a person and grown as an artist, but how do you think your growth as a person over the years has interacted with your growth as an artist? Um, I'd say I owe a lot more of that to my girlfriend than uh, oh, yeah? <laughs> anything, you know, I think it's, uh, I, I kind of, my manager uh, at the time, she would always call me uh peter pan she's like mm -hmm. you're peter pan like you're never gonna grow up mm -hmm. um and i think it's really having a life work balance mm -hmm. in, in any career is, is so important but especially music because it never turns off you know so i think that's something that i've i've tried to work on in the last few years it's like yeah i'm gonna put 110 percent into what i'm doing but I always need to carve out time to from life outside yeah. of outside of this. And and I'd say that's one thing I've probably grown the most on. And then during the pandemic, it, you know, that's probably a time where I was able to kind of, you know, focus more on, on life and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But yeah, I think that's for any artist. you know, you can drive yourself crazy if you're just connected 24 hours a day, you know, 100%. 100% man and then now, like you're like we mentioned kind of in the start of the interview and now that we're kind of talking about being able to shut it off I kind of want to bring it back to the creation of night service only um, the label that you have started in 2019 mm -hmm. now as someone who one collaborates with like or who is probably has their door being kicked over for collaborations and people trying to you know like CBS trying to get you to remix their jingle and stuff like that. You're clearly not someone 
who is in need of work. I imagine it is f- practically flooding out your mailbox. Now, kind of what made you want to start your own label and take on that responsibility uh, as label head, as label owner, as a, a tastemaker trying to get these artists off the ground? At the core of it's just that, like, I, I just wanted to have, as I grew, to be able to have an outlet to help other artists, you know, mm-hmm. and, and kind of pioneer some of the younger guys or newer artists that are, you know, don't, maybe don't have an outlet or, or whatever, you know, I don't care how big your following is or, or anything. I was like, if it's a dope record and I'm something I would want to play, then I'm down to sign it. Yeah. That being said, I'm, I'm sure some people are a little upset of not like, uh, I've been a little slow more recently on email, but it's like, if mm-hmm. you're, if you're hungry enough and the artists who are hungry enough, will find a way to get me the music, you know? And yeah, a lot of it is just people DMing me stuff and and that's the easiest way to for me to check it sometimes i'll find an obscure new artist and i'll play it in their other record in my radio show and then Mm -hmm. um then i'll you know they'll dm me be like thanks for playing this like can i send you music and and stuff like that uh but yeah i think the core of launching a label was just an outlet you know even with the radio show which is night service only radio and yeah on it blows revolution every tuesday Mm -hmm. Uh, um but even even with that it's just you know, i want to showcase you know cool music that not everyone is playing and you know i they <laughs> i love diplo and obviously i'm really grateful to be out on the uh to have it there mm-hmm. i think 10 p.m is a great time because i don't have the stress of necessarily putting more like radio or friendly yeah. music it's like i just want to play every week cool stuff you yeah. know you probably haven't heard of most of these songs are yet you know and mm. it's just yeah that's it for me you know it's it's being able to kind of now the same way like i mentioned earlier it was you know steve angelo with size Axwell yeah. with Axstone, yeah Tiesto with musical freedom it's like giving an opportunity to new artists and like being able to kind of be like check this out you know and mm-hmm. and give them an outlet is really important have you so i know you only kind of just got off the ground with it a couple of years ago but mm-hmm have there been any like stories or as far as like artists that you have worked with or helped have there been any stories that have like really stuck out to you that you're like yes this is why I did this like and you've like you helped that artist like get that break or something like that uh I mean I like Black Feet Neck they're really really good friends I don't take Mm -hmm. any credit but I did I did an early record with them I mean Shiba San was the one who put put them mm-hmm. on from the start mm-hmm. um so but le- watching their you know progression and you yeah. know afro jack is kind of taking them under their wing is seeing that is is awesome yeah and then there was there's another record that i put out by these brazilians uh dakar and and banan mm-hmm. and you know it's i was putting out club music during the pandemic so it kind of went under the radar but out of nowhere in january solomon like posted videos of one of his, his show he did in Costa Rica mm-hmm. and he I'm like flipping through and he played this track no way. which yeah I was like what the heck and um uh Pete Tong played in New York a couple weeks ago mm-hmm. and when I I saw him he's like he brought up that track because he he's like man I, I love this track and maybe there's a way we can work together on it to like give it a new life and I was like this is fucking crazy Pete yeah I was like I guess I told Pete Tong as a joke I was because he's one of the greatest yeah. your dance music and i yeah. was just like i was like i guess i'm a good a and r huh you know like <laughs> um so that was just like whoa like this is some my small label is is getting on the radar of these people yeah uh, that so that, i don't know yeah there's a lot of little stories and yeah i mean watching you know i was early on chapter and verse and like in, you know at the end of the day it's like you're your own biggest yeah you know factor in you and that just watching this guy's personality like ex, you know explode and his records start to really you know uh connect is has been awesome to watch so it's it's yeah. you know i don't take credit for and helping anyone i just do it because mm-hmm. i think it's cool music but you know being like oh, i was on this kid early you know that's like yeah. it's a it's a cool feeling for sure yeah 
So, you know, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end here. I got just a couple things left for you and then I'll get you uh, going on your afternoon here. Um, but one thing I kind of wanted to ask, you know, you're, like we said earlier, you've checked so many boxes now and you're really at a great like point of self-sustaining in your career and you got lots of work coming your ways. You're, you're putting new artists on through all of this time. What has been like one of the biggest challenges that you've had to navigate, whether it's in the industry, whether it's a creative process and how did navigating that challenge help you grow as an artist or as a person? Um, I think um, the biggest challenge is focusing, you know, I think I've always had in general trouble focusing, but, mm -hmm. you know, as an artist, it's not just like making music or DJing, you know, there's so many other things and, and, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to have a great management behind mm -hmm. me, but throughout the day, it's like, you know, there's something at every five minutes or every 10 minutes, there's like something. So I think a main thing for me is like being able to just, like mute everything and mm -hmm. just be able to focus on the creative um, yeah when not all the time but that time that i'm doing it is just like okay like everything else is off you know mm -hmm. i need to just not get distracted because in yeah. one second i my phone i'll get an email or something and i'll look at it and then it's just in, in your mind you know so yeah. i think that that's that's probably like the most important thing that i've worked on is like being able to just you know, focus on the creative when I yeah. need to. Um, yeah. Cool, man. Now, tying into that, kind of what might be some some advice that you would have for someone who's just starting to cut their teeth in their local scene, you know, who's wants to take their passion from hobby to career? Well, there's there's two there's two trajectories, right? You know, as New York is very hard because there's just so many DJs, right? Mm -hmm. So but I took the path of um, when I was starting out of not focusing on the DJ side. I was a yeah. DJ already. I knew I could DJ, mm -hmm. but it's a grind um, because all the clubs are like, how many people can you bring? Yeah. You know, how many people can you, we'll book you for these many dollars, but yeah. you need to bring in uh, this many people. Yeah. And I was, you know, I had a, I've always had a large network of friends, but I was like, I don't, I want to do that grind. Yeah. So yeah. I first focused on the production, you know, mm -hmm. and I still think to this day, it's, it's, it's very hard to break out of your city if you're not a producer. So mm -hmm. find the balance, focus on production, um, find your sound mm -hmm. and don't, don't rush it. You have to be patient, you yeah. know, because people's first impression is the one that lasts, you know, yeah. Um, it's very hard to change someone's mind. So yeah. uh, just, yeah, focus on your craft. And if you really, if you want to be a touring DJ producer, you have to produce, mm -hmm. you know, there's yeah. not, I can't name many that don't release music. Yeah. So that's really important. Cool, man. Well, final thing we got for you. All right. It's been a great conversation so far. I'm, I'm really <laughs> thoroughly enjoying this. Last thing we got for you is a speed round. All right. So we're going to go down a list of a few of a bunch of questions here, and most of them are going to be pretty easy, like a like a one word this or that kind of a thing. Some of them might make you think just a little bit. If you need to divulge a little bit of information or think a little on it, no worries. But oh. for the most part, they're going to be pretty quick, fun answers. All right. I I was up super late last night. My brain's a little running slower than usual. I'll try. Oh, dude, up. we're all good. We're all good. I won't make you think too hard. All right, here we go. House or techno? House. All right, club or warehouse? Ooh, warehouse. Nice. Rave or festival? Ooh, rave. Okay, digital or analog? Analog. All right, dream performance spot? Coachella. Even nice. Not a warehouse, but nice. Okay, dream collaboration? Fuck, this one's a hard one. Oh, man. Uh dream okay daft punk yeah, nice all right okay here we go last concert you attended as a fan rufus the soul nice best concert you've ever attended as a fan damn that's tough 
as a fan, just it was my like first real experience. I think it was Paul Van Dyke in Central Park. Wow. Oh, dude, yeah. I bet that was a sick show. In the rain. Like it was raining. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but it was crazy. I like, yeah. But that's amazing. Hell yeah. Okay. So what's your drink of choice? Um, I made the switch. I was always a vodka guy, tequila, tequila reposado. Nice. Uh, are you are you shooting it straight? Mm, shots yeah but no i can't do that I don't. Yeah. Uh, tequila soda nice yeah i'm a tequila tonic guy okay you walk into a house party and someone hands you the ox all right what song are you playing to get the party going man it's gonna be different it depends what what the vibe is i don't know i can't decide until i see what's happening in that room all right, little little crowd management. I like it. Spoken like a true a master at work there. Okay, so now it's the end of the night and the house party's winding down. What song are you closing the night with? Uh, man, Inner Bloom. All right. If you could only listen to one song for the rest of your life, what song would that be? Fuck. God damn. Damn, that's uh, that's not easy, man. Oh, I know. <laughs> I don't know. Every answer is just like not. I don't think I could do it. I, I don't think I could. Uh, man, what song? One song or no song, huh? God damn, man. I'll give I you an al- I'll give you an album if you want. I'll give you an album. Okay, album has nothing to do with dancers. If I would say John Mayer Continuum. Dude, John just gets it. Yeah, John just I, gets it, man. It's like it makes you feel shit and it's but it gets you can get you pumped up, but can also just like make you chill and think. I yeah. love that album for some reason. I, I don't know why. I just it's like an album that I would probably listen to the most. Dude, 100 percent. You know, as much as you know, as much of like almost a, a meme as John has become over the yeah. years, that man makes some amazing music. Yeah, I agree. Makes some incredible music. OK, so. If you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, past or present, who would it be? God damn. I'll give you three. Three? Damn, dead or alive. Kanye West. Okay. <laughs> um, End up on TMZ by the end of that dinner. Yeah. My grandpa. He okay. just passed away, so I would say my grandpa. Um, it's one person, man. Uh. Oh, who else? Uh, I have my girlfriend. Mm. All right. There you go. All right. What is my girlfriend? That's it. There you go. That's a hell of a dinner. <laughs> okay. Guilty pleasure food. Um, man, guilty pleasure food. Pizza for sure. New York style pizza. Nice. Can't go wrong with pizza. Can't go wrong. Okay. Would you rather face off against one horse sized duck or a hundred duck sized horses? That's hard. <laughs> I think I would have I have a better chance against a uh, hundred duck sized horses. Yeah, see, a lot of people seem to say a hundred duck sized horses, uh, probably because they're more manageably sized. But yes. dude, ducks are also depending on the duck, they're yeah. not that small. It's not like right here, like a hundred of those fuckers. Those might those might overrun you, man. Yeah, but uh, horse sized duck size wait duck sized horse man think about how big that beak is gonna be like, yeah dude no you're you're totally right horses are big so i'd ra- yeah man like that's a big beak ducks, yeah you know, i don't know yeah it's no i think i think you're right question yeah i think we'll find out one day <laughs> <laughs> okay just a couple more what is something that you are proud of yourself for um uh Pursuing my dreams. Nice. What is an area in which you hope to grow? Um, sleeping better. Nice, dude. That's so important. I, dude, I'm with you on that one. I wish I could get a full night's sleep. Oh, God, it's killing me. Okay. And last, but certainly not least, before I want to die, I want to blank. Um, 
see hang out with my whole family nice nice well carlos dude that's all we got for you brother this has been a great conversation i hope you had some fun yeah i had a blast man thank you dude this is gonna be sick to see you on tour i can't wait to watch you blow it up i'm sure you're gonna be just laying down some incredible tracks and some incredible unreleased tracks too so oh, gotta, what i've been building up is just tons of unreleased stuff that i'm excited to play. yes dude well you heard it folks so we'll be excited to see you come through this has been sid i've been austin miller and we'll see you next time have a good one sid you too Oh, 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 oh,